Hey, you guys, how are you? You glad to be in church this morning? I am too, and I'm really glad to be at this church. This is exciting. What a cool uh, series that you guys have been going through. Welcome if you're watching us online or the 1230 service as well. And uh, I always like to know a little bit about who I'm speaking to. Let me find out something about us. Anybody in here engaged to be married? Stand up if you're engaged to be married, would you? All right. A couple of you over here. Over here. Awesome. Congratulations, you guys. That's fantastic. Anybody, uh, you're not quite engaged, but you're on the edge of commitment. <laughs> and you'd like to make an announcement this morning of any guy. No. Um, how about uh, newlyweds? Anybody like married 12 months or less? Stand up if you're a newlywed, would you? All right. Wow, you're kind of in a, the same group back there. All right. Um, and how about uh, couples have been married more than a year? It's not a trick question. Go ahead and stand up. More than, uh, <laughs> I love it how the, some people are clapping. Wow, more than a year. Um, keep standing if you've been married more than five years, more than 10 years, more than 15. I can see some of you doing the math. More than 20. By the way, I'm talking about being married to the same person consecutively. <laughs> 25, 30, you're looking at me like, just keep going, kid. <laughs> 35, 40 years of marriage or more. <laughs> awesome. How long have you guys been married? 51. Awesome. That's great. We've got a new Buick for you out in the parking lot, and uh, if you can't find it, uh, talk to the pastor. Um, hey, uh, that's awesome. And wherever you are on the spectrum, if you're single, and uh, chances are you're going to be married someday. So uh, what an opportunity to get to talk about uh, marriage in this series together. Leslie and I, it's been 30 years. By the way, we have the same name. I know it's confusing. I'm Leslie. She's Leslie. It's just the way God planned it for us. And uh, to make it even more complex, I'm the third. That means my dad's name is Leslie. My grandfather's name is Leslie. I'm married to Leslie. My name's Leslie. So when we had our first son, we named him John. John Leslie. So, and by the way, I married a Texas girl, San Antonio. So, uh, yeah, I know that makes you like me better. So, um, hey, it, this is going to be fun. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about... Uh, uh, marriage and relationships as a whole, and uh, just to kind of parachute into the midst of this series that you guys have been doing, I want to talk about something that I think, if you don't get this one right, the rest of it is really challenging. Um, last night, we go to a lot of weddings, just because of the work that we do, and so we've seen some interesting things take place at weddings. One has always stood out for us, happened a long time ago, and it had to do with a little ring bearer who was about three or four or five years old, something like that. Had the little white tuxedo on with the tie, the little shorts and the knee-high socks. And as he was doing the wedding walk, you know, as they teach him to do, he's coming down the center aisle. You know, and every few steps, he would pause, he would look at the congregation, and he would go, <laughs> And he was growling at people. And we were all cracking up. It was incredible. This is awesome. But uh, why is he doing that? And uh, he came down to the altar. He stood like a perfect little gentleman. He kind of forgot about it because he was so well behaved until we had the recessional. And then he growled at more people on the way out. And uh, he just stole the show. Everybody was abuzz talking about this when we got to the reception afterwards. Well, word spread. This little guy, as a four-year-old, he had the impression that he was supposed to be the ring bear. <sighs> right? What's a ring bearer anyway, if you're three or four years of age? And uh, by the way, I know some of you are thinking I made that story up. That's happened at two different weddings uh, that I've been to. One of them that I was in, and the little guy had a, a meltdown at the tuxedo store because he thought he was getting a bear costume. So, um, but Leslie and I, we left that first experience. We said, this is a perfect illustration of how our beliefs, right or wrong, are still the fuel for our behavior right? It's what you believe about 
something that caused you to act in a certain way about that. And that's why I want to look at uh, uh, some, sometimes some crooked thinking that comes around on marriage, and that is that we, we buy into this, this myth, this idea that this person that we marry is supposed to meet all of our needs. They're supposed to just kind of make up for everything that we're lacking. And when we buy into that myth, it really causes some difficulties in our lives. If you know anything about academic settings, you know that professors can't just dream up classes and start teaching them. You've got to give them approved by the provost and the dean and the committees and all that stuff. And a few years back, Leslie and I, we had this idea. We wanted to start a class on our college campus in Seattle on relationships and marriage. And, um, you know, we just call it Relationships 101. And we put a little proposal together for the committees to review and all that. And, um, well, we had a long list of things. We wanted to talk about how to keep family ties from pulling strings. The home you grew up in, that was your university of relationships. We want to talk about that. We want to talk about friendship and, and uh, you know, what do you do when friends fail? And if you haven't had that happen yet, put your seatbelt on because it's coming. We all have our own private Gethsemane. We all have our own private Judas. I trusted you with my money. I trusted you with my secrets. How could you have done that? I want to lecture on all this stuff. How to fall in love without losing your mind. How to improve your love IQ. How to break up in a dating relationship and stay in one piece. How to bridge the gender gap. All this. How to relate to God without feeling phony. All the different realms of relationship we put on this thing, brought it to this committee. They studied it for a while and said, mm, thanks, but no thanks. We said, why not? We thought this would be such a practical course, you know? It doesn't matter whether your major is nursing or accounting or anything else. The hub of the wheel for fulfillment in life is our relationships and, and especially marriage. And why not have the skills for that? There's tons of research on it. They said, well, your course just doesn't have enough rigor to it. And I said, what do you mean? They said, it doesn't have enough academic rigor. I said, oh, we can put some information in that'll confuse the students if you like, you know? And they said, well, there's not even a textbook for the class. We said, we'll write our own. They said, well, other universities don't have classes like this. I said, well, maybe they should. Maybe they will. They said, well, it's not going to work here. So we left, felt kind of dejected, you know, and we couldn't quite let go of it. Came back about three months later, that same group proposed it again. Thanks, but no thanks. Went through this three times that academic year. And finally, on the third round, I think we kind of wore them down. And they said, um, OK, here's the deal. We're going to let you teach this class but only under these conditions, and they started to list them off. They said, number one, it'll need to be pass-fail. Number two, it'll need to be a general elective, so it's not required for anybody. Number three, it'll need to be taught as an overload. That's in addition to your full-time responsibilities. Number four, it'll need to be taught uh, on your own time schedule, meaning once all the other classes have been filled, if you can find an empty space on campus to do that. Oh, yeah, and then number five, they said you'll need to teach it without compensation. So with that pat on the back, we set off to this class, Relationships 101. And um, we had a little room that was, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe 12 chairs at 6.30 at night on a Monday. <clears throat> and I'm going to need some water. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and just throw it up here. That'd be great. Thank you so much. And uh, 6.30 at night, not, not prime time for a class. And... Uh, yeah, that's what we could do. And we thought, even if we get half the chairs filled, we'll, we'll be all right. You know, that'll get us started, you know, be underway. And we put the course description in the catalog, just waited to see if any students might sign up for this thing. And uh, it was about 10.30 in the morning, first day of registration. And I get a call in my office from the registrar, and he says, hey, doc, he says, uh, we're going to have to move your classroom. I said, why? What happened? Nobody signed up? You need the space already or what? He said, no, no, no. He said, uh, we just realized you didn't cap the course. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you didn't limit the number of students that could take the class. I said, what does that have to do with anything? He said, well, about 300 students have registered here in the last uh, hour. He said, by default, the uh, computer moved you into the auditorium, moved the class that was in there into the little classroom that you had. And I said, keep talking. And, uh, and that was over 15 years ago that happened. Doesn't that speak volumes? about the hunger and thirst we have for information on healthy relationships. We love teaching that class. I'm going to be teaching it tomorrow night. We love teaching that class. These students, they don't have to be there. They want to be there. We tell them on the very first night of this class, it doesn't matter to us whether you take any notes the entire semester. There's no pop quiz, no midterm. You know, you're going to get out of this, whatever it is that you'd like to get out of it, except tonight. 
on the very first night, we want you to write down at least one single sentence. And we tell them this sentence that we're about to give you, and I'm going to give it to you in just a moment. This sentence that we're about to give you, it has the potential to revolutionize all your relationships, and particularly your marriage. If you can allow the truth of this sentence I'm about to give you to seep down into your cortex and be lived out through your spirit, it has the potential to revolutionize the way you relate to one another. And they all get poised with their pencil and they're ready to take it down and we finally give it to them. I want to give it to you right now if you want to write it down too. Here it is. If you try to build intimacy with another person, if you try to build intimacy with another person, before you've done the work of getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. Let me say it again. If you try to build a connection with another person, before you've done the difficult work of getting whole on your own, all your relationships, including your marriage, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. And they'll fall flat. Guaranteed. Why? Because nobody was designed to complete you. <laughs> That's a tough pill to swallow for some of us. But nobody was designed to complete you. Just want to remind you, here on this Sunday morning, that ultimately your compulsion for completion is not met in this marriage relationship. It's met in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And I know that's sometimes a tough pill to swallow for some of us because we grow up, we're reading the fairy tales and, and we read the books that, talk, you know, the romance, and, and then we go to movies. In fact, the most iconic movie of all about, really, that puts us in, in place is, remember Jerry Maguire? Remember that? One of the most quoted movies in all of cinematic history. Everybody came out of that theater quoting that one line. What was it? Show me the money, right? Every romantic came out of the theater quoting another line. What was it? Yeah, you complete me, right? You had me at hello, right? Do you remember the scene? Tom Cruise, his character's fallen in love with Renee Zellweger's character. They've gotten married, having a really tough go of it that first year. Something Leslie and I can identify with. In fact, the very first line of our book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, said, says we never had pre-marriage counseling, but we spent the first year of our marriage in therapy. And that's the truth. So we can identify. He comes home from this business trip where he's enjoying some great success, and he realizes that uh, it's not nearly as fulfilling without having things right on the home front. And so he comes home to repair it and walks up the steps of that little house and into the living room, and he realizes he's walked in the middle of this support group. All these women are sitting around, they're commiserating about how miserable men can be. And he's walked right in the midst of it. And he puts his luggage down, and he says, I'm looking for my wife. And he sees her there across the way. She's behind this lamp, and she sticks her head out. And he launches into this amazing speech. I'm guessing it took, you know, like three writers a couple weeks to craft this speech. And he gets to the climax of that speech, and he says those words, you complete me. He says them with such pathos. He says them with, in fact, is there any guy in here that can say it just like Tom Cruise? Anybody want to stand up and show us how it's done? Okay, I'm going to give you my, my best here. He looks at her, in fact, I'll give it right to the camera. He looks at her as if she's the only woman on the planet. All these other women that are in the group, their jaws have dropped down to the floor. They can't believe the words coming out of this guy's mouth. And he looks at her, and he says, you, complete me. It's exactly how he says it, and I look a lot like him, too, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I like that dramatic pull-in on the camera that you did back there, too. That was great. And, uh, and every romantic that sees that, when they get to that part and they hear that line, what do they do? Oh, oh I wish somebody would say that to me. Oh, I'd love to say that to somebody else. Well, let me tell you, I'm no psychologist or anything, but if you, well, I actually am. But, uh, but if, you, if you believe that somebody else can complete you, you're setting yourself up for serious heartache. Nobody was ever designed to do that for you. I mean, and yet it's something that's so tough to give that up in a marriage relationship. In fact, hey, can I borrow you two right there? Are you married? Are you dating? Or? 
You engaged? Perfect. Come right up here. Just stand here. Let's take five seconds, all right? And um, how long have you been engaged? One day. Two One day? Two days. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, <right> <laughs> Look at her. Wow. This, we should do something else than I was planning on doing. This is incredible. Congratulations, you guys. Stand around and face the audience there and stand about a foot apart. Try not to touch her for a second. There you go. And then, uh, yeah, no, face them and then just a foot apart. And then just lean your shoulders in on each other just a little bit. And then gently put your heads together. And we see a couple like that. And what do we say? Aww. Aww. All right, you're making a six. Sit down. Okay. <laughs> Now, I could take you to college campuses nearly any place in the world and show you couples that literally walk around like that. I mean, they, they just walk into the dining hall. They're just kind of like that. They walk in the library. They're kind of like that. They're what Leslie and I call A-frame relationships, okay? <laughs> now, what happens in an A-frame relationship when you've got two people that walk around like that and one of them stumbles? Right, the whole relationship gives way, right? Because what happens is it becomes overly dependent. And, and, and when you get married with this mindset that this person is going to, you know, make me whole, they're going to be my shortcut to well-being, when you buy into that idea, that misbelief, they, they end up not just leaning in on each other, they start to pound down on each other. Hey, man, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what I signed up for. You said you were going to do this. This is the kind of wife you were supposed to This kind of husband that you were going to be. That's no way to live. And that's why I want to talk to you about this subject this morning and how to get whole, how to get healthy. It's the most important thing you'll ever do for your marriage. You see, your marriage can only be as healthy as you are. Wow, if you're taking notes, write that one down. Your marriage can only be as healthy as you are. Therefore, one of the most important things you'll ever do to get healthy, I mean, to have a, to have a healthy relationship is to work on who you are in the context of it. You guys ever heard the name Neil Clark Warren? If you haven't heard of him, you've probably heard of his company, eHarmony. You ever heard of eHarmony? If you haven't heard of eHarmony, you have simply got to watch more television, okay? Uh, that, the idea for that company came about in a conversation at a dinner uh, around a dining room table in uh, Pasadena, California, about 15, 16 years ago. And Leslie and I were sitting there with Neil and Marilyn when he started talking about this concept. And in the context of that conversation, I remember we talked about a lot of things that night. That was a late night conversation. But uh, one of the things I asked Neil during that conversation, I said, hey, if you could only give one word of advice to a couple about to be married, what would it be? And I mean, he thought for a split second, it was right there on the tip of his tongue. And he said, get yourself healthy before you get yourself married. See, that's what we're talking about here, getting healthy. Why? Let me say it again. Your marriage can only be as healthy as the least healthy person in it. So if you're like me, you go, okay, how do I know if I'm healthy? How do I get healthy spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, relationally healthy? Well, Neil and I, that conversation led to about a year and a half of research, and we interviewed a bunch of people, and we had a mountain of information and we brought it to a, a publisher and said, hey, we want to write a book on this stuff. They said, well, how are you going to make it accessible? This is a lot of information. And so we began to sift through it, you know, how to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, as every writer wants to do. And, and we, we finally said, we think that if you're going to be healthy, you've got to get a lock on these three things. And we outlined them. The publisher said, let's do this. This sounds like a great project. And, and we did. We published this book, and literally about a month and a half after the book came out, I was on an airplane. I was reading my Bible. And I came on this passage in Ephesians chapter 3 that I'm going to read to you in a moment. And I went, oh, <laughs> there's that thing that I thought we invented, right? That I thought we discovered right there in God's word. Paul outlined it beautifully in the same order and everything that we were talking about it. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. But let me give you these three things real quickly this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. Here's the first one. If you want to be healthy, you've got to get a lock on what we call your profound significance, Profound significance. In other words, you've got to see how profoundly significant you are in the eyes of God. That God loves you as if you're the only person on the planet to love, as St. Augustine said. You've got to, in fact, not just see it, not just recognize it, not just kind of bring it into your mind, but you've got to feel it deep down in your bones. 
You got to experience that kind of grace that we were just singing about so beautifully just a few moments ago. You know, and, and it's not just about quoting scripture and Romans 8, and we can, we can know all this stuff, but it's another thing to experience it and, and allow it to fill our, our own spirit so that other people see it. You know, that, that profound significance. If you struggle with it, and I know some of you are going, man, you don't know my story. You don't know. Grace just like bounces off me. You're right, I don't know it. If you struggle with it, let me, let me challenge you to tune into the single most important conversation you ever have. You had it this morning before we came into this building. You had it last night. You're going to have it this afternoon after Sunday brunch. You're going to have it tomorrow. In fact, you're going to have this conversation while you're asleep because this conversation never turns off. It's 24-7. It's your self-talk. It's your internal dialogue. Imagine if before you fell asleep tonight, you could pull a little computer chip out of the back of your head and slip it into your laptop, and it would tabulate all of your internal dialogue for the last 24 hours. Can you imagine? And it would dump it into one of two categories, either positive self-talk or negative self-talk. Which one of those would be most full for you at the end of any given day? Might surprise you to know if you're like most people on average, you'd discover that about 73% of your self-talk would fall into the negative bucket. We know that from research at UCLA. But not the person who has a lock on their profound significance. Not the person that has experienced God's love deep down in their bones. Look at this passage. In fact, I don't want you to even look at it. I just want you to listen to it. I'm going to read it from the message. And uh, you'll hear it with uh, maybe some new ears if you're familiar with this verse. It's uh, toward the last part of chapter 3 of Ephesians. And Paul is saying this. He says, I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love that you'll be able to take in with all Christians the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. I love how he puts that. The extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. He says, reach out and experience the breadth. Test the length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of of God. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. It's as if he's saying, hey, make sure you realize your compulsion for completion is not met in this marriage relationship. Ultimately, it's met in a relationship with your heavenly father. I hope you got that message. If you've been going to church very long, especially this church, you hear it, you know, you got to get this relationship right for the other relationships to work, and it begins by accepting God's grace, God's love. Second thing we say you got to get a lock on is not just your profound significance, but what we call unswerving authenticity. This is the second thing you can write down, unswerving authenticity. See, the first one has to do with your relationship with God. Unswerving authenticity has to do with your relationship with you. Unswerving, it's being true to you. Can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come into my counseling office struggling with that proverbial disease to please. You know what I mean? Some of you know exactly what I mean. That proverbial disease to please. Because you walk around and you just go, oh, maybe if I did this, so-and-so would like me. Oh, maybe so-and-so would smile in my direction if I, if I chose this instead of that. Oh, oh, maybe I'd get accepted into this club or this group. Maybe I'd get mom and dad's blessing if I did that. Maybe my spouse would, if I, if I you know, and, and, and you just live life and you're walking around on eggshells and you're just, that's no way to live either. It's no way to live, you know? See, there's a path that God has carved out for every one of us. And when we walk down that path, in spite of what anybody else thinks, life begins to get pretty interesting. That's when we begin to love the life we live because it doesn't matter. <laughs> we're going to get critiqued. We do it anyhow. It doesn't matter that we're going to get criticized. It doesn't matter that we're going to be put down. It doesn't matter that somebody else may not accept it. We know this is the pathway that God has asked us to, call, to follow, and, and we're, we're not going to move from it. That's what, you remember when the book The Purpose Driven Life came out? I remember I was at Zondervan just a few days before they released that. They were so excited about this book, and I remember they were talking about it at the publishing house in Grand Rapids, and, and we were out to dinner, and I'll never forget this, and I heard the title for the first time, and I said, whoa. I said, I don't know about the book's content yet, because I haven't read it, but that is a powerful title, The Purpose. Who doesn't want purpose in their life? See, that's what this is all about. Unswerving authenticity is knowing your purpose. Why on earth am I here and not swerving off that path? 
The next passage that Paul puts in front of us here, it says this. He says, I want you to go out there and walk. And then he says, better yet, run. Run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. The first couple verses of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Isn't that remarkable? Get out there on the path. Don't just walk. Run down that path that God has called it. Third thing we say, if you want to be a healthy individual, it's not just your profound significance, feeling that deep in your bones. It's not just that you have unswerving authenticity, that you're following the path that God has called you as a husband, as a wife to follow, as a couple to follow. But it's also what we call self-giving love. This is the third thing. You can write that down. Self-giving love. This is where you begin to look at life beyond the boundaries of your own needs. And let me tell you, when you get a lock on this in your marriage, your marriage will never be the same. When you begin to put yourself in your partner's shoes and see the world from his or her perspective, because it's no longer about me, when you begin to do that, and you begin to walk in each other's shoes, practice empathy, life doesn't get much sweeter. It really is. It's, it's the truth. How many of you have teenagers at home? Mom and dad, raise your hand if you've got teenagers. What's the number one goal of every adolescent on the planet? Do you know? It's never articulated, but it's deeply felt. It's all about identity. Who am I? Right? They walk into a social setting. How am I doing? What do people think of me? How are my shoes? Are they in style? You guys wearing these shoes? You know? How about my hair? Is it good? What about my pants? Are they low enough? I don't know. You know? <laughs> it's all about identity. Who am I? And you don't have to be 13 to be asking those questions. You can be 30. You don't have to be 15. You can be 50. Still be asking those questions. It's almost like we're wearing sometimes mirrored sunglasses, but we've taken the lenses out, we flip them around, and we put them back in the, the frames, and we look out at the world, and what do we see? Yeah, reflection of our own needs. And when we do that, sometimes what ends up happening, particularly in marriage, is we project our own neediness onto our spouse and then attempt to meet those needs when we're really meeting our own needs, you know? Not the person who has a lock on self-giving love. Because when you, you do this, you walk into a social setting, including your own marriage, and no longer say, hey, how am I doing? What am I going to get out of this experience? But instead you say, how are you doing? And you really mean it. And you transcend, like I said, your own needs to meet somebody else's. Man, when you do this in marriage, this is, and you might be asking yourself, how do I know when I get there? How do I know if I'm doing this? Well, the best barometer, the best milestone, that's a good word in this church, for knowing whether or not you've done this is when you begin to live out the greatest relationship lecture that has ever been given the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. Jesus gave it to us in the Sermon on the Mount. It's radical, so get ready. It's radical. In fact, it was driven home for me in, of all places, Rome, Italy. I had a bunch of airline miles that were going to expire. I told Leslie, I said, we got to use these. She said, that's the last thing we need to do right now is get on an airplane. She said, why don't you go someplace with your dad? I said, that's not a bad idea. I called dad, living in Phoenix, and I said, Dad, I said, I got about five days on my calendar, and uh, I thought, what about you and me? We go to Rome. I've never been there. I want to go to Rome, and I, you can show me around. I know you've been there. And he said, that sounds great, son. He said, let's do it. I said, fantastic. I said, here's the deal, Dad. I will pick up the airfare if you want to pay for everything else. And it worked out pretty good for me. <laughs> and uh, we went to Rome. And one night, we're having dinner, and he reminds me of something I remember studying when I was in uh, seminary. And that is, in the time of the Roman Empire, every kid in the Roman Empire was required by law to carry a Roman soldier's backpack one mile in either direction from his home. It was just a way of giving the soldiers a rest. And so in villages all over the place on roads, you would find that little kids had marked off that Roman mile they've gone and pounded a stake into the ground, put their initials on it so they knew exactly how far they had to walk, and then put the backpack on the other side, and then boom, I did what I'm supposed to do. Can't arrest me. I got a clear conscience, you know? It was such a common practice that Jesus used it in a sermon illustration and said, hey, 
In your relationships, in your marriage, you want to do something radical? He said, don't just walk the first mile. We do that because we're decent human beings. Don't just walk the first mile. Walk another mile that nobody sees coming. See what happens when you do that. When was the last time somebody walked the extra mile for you? It's memorable, right? You can think of it. When was the last time you walked the extra mile for somebody else, particularly in your own home, particularly in your own marriage, right? That sometimes is challenging because some of us think, oh, man, the extra mile, that's a big deal. I got to Google that. I got to save up for that. That's going to be expensive. No, no, no. Friend, you're going to have the opportunity to walk the extra mile before this day is even done for your spouse. When you begin to transcend your own boundary, you get a lock on self-giving love. You will love the life you live. No doubt about it. Look at the next passage that Paul gives us here. In Ephesians, he says this. Pour yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, and quick at mending fences. Pour yourselves out for each other in love. That's all you need to hear this morning. That's it, man. Pour yourself out for each other in acts of love. If you try to build intimacy, if you try to build a connection with another person before you've done the difficult work of getting whole, getting healthy on your own, all your relationships, including your marriage, will become an attempt to complete yourself and it'll fall flat, guaranteed. What a good group of pastors. I bet you love preaching to these folks. Boy, do they listen well. This has been a real honor. Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in this room today with people that love you, that want to love you better, that want to love each other better. That's why we're here. We want to be better people. Help us to be the best we can be by working on who we are in the context of our relationships. In your holy name, amen.